Now today I am joined on the Vintage Rock Pod by a genuine legend of the rock music industry, part of three of the most influential groups of all time and toured the world with some of the biggest names in rock music. He's a rock and roll hall of famer and highly regarded as one of the best drummers of all time. Welcome to the Vintage Rock Pod, Mr. Kenny Jones. Thank you for the build-up. I can't believe it's me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when you look back at your career, it's a phenomenal career. You look back at the names you've worked with, Steve Marriott and, and Rod Stewart and Ronnie Wood and Roger Daltrey and Pete Townsend and Paul Rogers. And it's like, it literally is a who's who of rock music, isn't it? Well, they're all mates, so it's quite easy to work with those guys. That's good to know. Um, now, you're largely and quite rightly regarded as one of the best drummers of all time. So where did your interest and fascination with drumming begin? Where did it all begin for you behind the drum kit? Oh, well, uh, I started when I was cleaning it. When I was very young, I was about 12 years old. And me and my mate were cleaning cars for pocket money. And uh, we were cleaning this car and a sponge hit me right in the face. He threw the sponge to get my, my attention. And I thought, well, what's, what's he done that for? He said, I think we should form a skiffle group. So I went around the car thinking, what's that? So I threw the sponge back at him. I said, what's a skiffle group? And he said, well, when you get your dad's uh, tea chest or something, you know, cause we had loads of tea chests in the garden. Because my, my uncle Dave delivered tea that fell off the back of a lorry. So we had to go to tea when I was a kid. So he said, you get a, a tea chest, put a broom handle in one end, piece of string on one end and then another on the other end on the corner and you pull that tight and that makes the sound of a bass. So I'm listening all the time, very inquisitive. And he said, then you get your, your, your grand's sort of uh, washboard and, th and thim you put a stick of thimble on, uh, your sewing kit thim thimbles on the end of your fingers. And he said, then you strum it up and down. So I, at this point I thought, he's gone absolutely <laughs> mad. He's gone mad, he's nuts, he's gone nuts. So he's on something, I don't know what he's on, but I don't want it. And so he said, well, this is a skiffle group is on tonight on TV about five or six o'clock. Let's go and watch that. So I said, great. So we went to my house and watched this um, TV programme come on, this music TV programme. I think it was the Six Five Special. Um, and it was, my, in those days, it was, um, the TVs were like looking in an eyeball. Because mm. <laughs> so, uh, they're all like uh, oval shape um, in black and white, and this band came on, and it was uh, uh, Lonnie Donegan, and he was playing a banjo, singing "Rock on the Line," and I was totally hooked. I was totally hooked on the banjo. <laughs> I really wanted to play the banjo, and funny enough, I'd seen a banjo in Bethnal Green pawn shop right next to the station. And I thought, okay, well, and it's been, it was a bit there for months and months and months. So the, the next day we went up to buy this banjo with no money in our pockets. And the banjo had gone. So I went, oh, no. So I went in the guy, I had to go at the guy, I said, where's the banjo? And he said, well, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of been, it's a pawn shop. He's kind of paid for it and taken it away. And I was really upset about it. I said, well, get it back. He said, you can't, can't get it back. So um, me and my mate walked down the road and he said, my mate said to me, you're really upset, aren't you? I said, yeah, I am. I really want to play that banjo because I fell in love with the sound of it. Mm -hmm. um, he said, well, look, my mate's got a, a drum kit. So I get him to bring it over this afternoon. So I said, OK. So I brought it over this afternoon and it ended up being one bass drum and a floor tom tom. And that was it. <laughs> and two sticks of which one of them was broken in half. So I said, OK, right. Okay, not knowing what to do with them, so we tried to glue the stick back together because my dad was a bit of a carpenter, and there was no super glue in those days. And uh, so, after several attempts, it never worked. So I learned to play drums on that particular uh, small, tiny little couple of you know, one tom tom and a bass drum uh, in uh, with one and a half sticks. Uh, and I got hooked on the drums, and then uh, it's only a bit later. I uh, my my dear cousin who's like my brother, he's, a, he's an only child and I'm an only child, very close. And uh, he said, well, look, let's go, and, there's a music shop up the road, let's go, he's a bit older than me, let's go and uh, see if there's any drums in there. So we went up there. There was a shop called the J60s in uh, Green Lane Manor Park in the East End. And I went there, and there was this great uh, 
drum kit, a white drum kit, Olympic drum kit. I fell in love with that. I didn't know what skins were, but I mean, uh, the guy in there kept saying, uh, it's got real pig skins on, real calf skins. You know? So I uh, just fell in love with that kit. So I said, how much was that? And he said it was uh, 64 pounds uh, and thir 13p. Uh, no, no, 10 shillings and tuppence or something like, something like that. And I said, oh, great. He said, what you're going to have to do, though, is you, you, you're going to have to get your parents, uh, you get, oh, have you got the cash? I said, no, I haven't got the cash. He said, well, you have, you have to put it on HP. And the only HP I knew was HP source. <laughs> of course. So, um, so he said, you have to get your parents to sign it. Oh, no, no. He said, well, look, you've got to go get a £10 deposit and come back and with the documents and we'll, we'll, um, you know, we'll, we'll sort it out from there. And I got on the bus and went back and, uh, the, the, uh, my mum wasn't in, but her purse was in. <laughs> so I looked at this purse on the mantelpiece for ages and I thought, okay, I've got to go in there, went in there, I opened it up and there was 10 pounds in there. So I just thought, I'm only borrowing it. So, so I took it back on the bus, gave it to the guy, and he said, right, we'll deliver them this afternoon where we can get your mum and dad to sign the papers. I went, what? <laughs> he said, oh, so, okay, just bring them. So I gave him my address and about, about five o'clock in the evening, um, the door, knock on the door. Um, my mum said, who's that? No one ever knocks on our door at that time. You know? So my dad had to go up to the, answer the door and open the door. And this guy walks in with a big bass drum <laughs> straight through. And I said, oh, bring it in here, mate. Bring it in here. And it, it brought him and set the kit up. My dad was looking at me with daggers in his eyes. <laughs> totally dumbfounded. Um, I can't imagine. It's, it's kind of, we go, it's a bit of a long story. It's in my book, by the way. Mm. Um, and uh, so I just thought, okay, right. He just, I watched him set them all up. And, everything. and my mum was standing there, totally dumbfounded as well. Didn't say a word. They didn't say a bloody word. Because I'm an only child as well, so I'm spot rotten apparently. With love and affection, <laughs> no money. So there you go. So then um, the um, so he set him up and he s sat behind the drum kit and he said, "Do you play drums?" I said, "No." <laughs> he said, "Well, I better show you something." So he showed me. He got these brushes out, and I don't know if you've ever seen sticks. So I thought, "What the bloody hell are they?" You know, so he did this jazz beat, you know, on the snare. <laughs> And I watched him, I thought, I said, okay, so. And he said, right, you sit down and you have a go. So you show me how to hold the sticks. And, and I, sorry, the brushes, and I was just sat there. And I closed my eyes, I looked at my mum and, well, I looked at my mum and dad, looked at the sticks, sorry, the brushes and the, and the drums, I went, and I thought, okay, closed my eyes and I went, and I could hear it, I was playing exactly what he told me. I couldn't believe it. And so I opened my eyes, and apparently my mum and dad said, we've never seen such a smile of contentment on your, anyone's face like your face. So we signed the HP, HP form straight away. And that's how I got into it. That's incredible. Absolutely incredible story. And just think, yeah. if you'd have got the banjo, then things could have been very different for the, for the whole of the well, music industry. One day, when I, when I got some money years later, I just thought, one day I'm going to buy myself a banjo. So I went and bought my banjo, but I bought the wrong banjo. I bought a lead banjo. It's fantastic banjo. And I said, one day when I get old enough, I'm going to learn how to play that with a rocking chair. And I never got around to it. I've got the banjo. <laughs> still got time. You've still got time. Yeah. <laughs> so um, you've, you've got your first kit and things like that. How old were you when um, the small faces got together then? Because you, you guys were really young, weren't you? Well, I, I, so the band started when I uh, heard about this band playing in uh, this jazz band playing in a local pub called the British Prince. And I, um, I went up there one sort of Friday evening and uh, sat watching the watching the, the drummer, and it, he's he's uh, one of these guys that. Play Between the snare drum and him, and he wrapped his arms around like that and just started to sing. And I was just watching him. Um, and thinking I'll pick up a few tips. Anyway, they had a break afterwards, the halfway through the, the set, 
and the guy came up to me, the drummer, because I was sitting right in front of him, and he said, you taking the piss out of me? I said, what? He said, why do you keep blinking at me? I said, I don't keep blinking. I said, oh, I know why, because when you play drums, you blink, you go like that. You know, and he went, no, I don't. <laughs> oh, God. So, yeah, I went through that one. Anyway, I got to know the guy, went up there a couple of weeks, whatever, and one day he said, right, we've got um, special guests going to come up and play, a young drummer is going to come up and play. I thought, oh, great, another one, watch another drummer, who's that? And he introduced me, and now my, my whole world fell apart. I went, oh, no, I've never played with a band before in my life. So I, cause I found myself sitting behind the drums, and I, I saw there was these three giants I looked up at. I mean, I was sitting, I just kept, they looked like real giants looking at me, looking down at me, and I'm looking up at them. And the guys, it's just one of them just says, shouts out, like, um, just counts me in. He goes, it sounded to me like, one, two, three, four. It's in slow motion. But it was like, one, two, one, two, three, four. And it was like a bit, bit of a jazz thing. So I found myself playing, and I, was, I couldn't believe I was playing with them. And they were playing with me. And I, I was it, I was off. I was, in, I was in heaven. I'd broken the umbilical cord. Fantastic, was, fantastic. When I go off and sat shaking, like holding this half a pint, looking like I was old enough to drink, and uh, this guy came up to me and he said, it was a barman, and he said, he said, that was great. He said, um, are you in a band? I said, no, I'm forming one right now. He said, well, my, my brother, two weeks ago, he just bought a guitar. And I said, oh, okay, great. Shall I bring him down next week? So I said, okay, great. So he brought him down the, the following week. In through the door walks Ronnie Lane, basically. <laughs> and that's how I met Ronnie Lane. And he was learning to play guitar. And he had a Gresh uh, guitar like George Harrison. You know? and, uh, and we formed a band together. And that's how we got started. That's incredible, isn't it? And then, we, and then after a while, Ronnie said, I don't want to play. I don't want to. I'm cutting a long story short here. Mm. I don't want to play guitar. I said, I want to play bass. So I said, well, let's go up to the shop where we, I bought my drums and by chance you bought your guitar. And so we went up there and it's one Saturday morning and this guy came up and said, oh, can, can I help you? It's like a real cocky little geezer. And so uh, I said, well, he wants, to, he wants to learn to play bass. So he wants a bass, he wants to buy a bass. So he, um, he said, well, yeah, try this one. So Ronnie sat down trying that one. I saw this drum cat out of the corner of my eye. And so I sat behind that and I started to play. And this guy who was working in the shop picked up the guitar and started to play. And that was Steve Barrett. Oh. So we invite, we, Ronnie and I had already formed a band, so we invited him to come and play with our band that evening. Um, so, we, so we said, look, we've got a special guest going to come up and sing. And uh, so that was it. And we, we got up and started to sing, brought the house down. The rest of the band were really annoyed because Steve stood on the piano and and uh, started breaking all the keys. He didn't realise what he was doing, but he broke them and standing on the top of it, and sort of doing all that. Bring the audience loved it, and the the, uh, the the owner of the pub sort of came out and threw us all out. So they didn't like us at all. So that was it. Um, we ended up the rest of the band wouldn't talk to us. They drove off, and we ended up uh, sitting on the pavement on the other side of Tower Bridge. Um, just with sitting on my drum cases, Ronnie's uh, guitar, and and um, and and me and, and and Steve. So the three of us just sat there, and we just looked at each other, burst out laughing, and that is the birth of the small faces. Absolutely incredible! Absolutely. Uh, my age at that time was probably probably about just fourteen, I think, something like that. That's phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal yeah. to, to do that at such a young age. And then you guys, yeah. you, as a group, you were only together for a short amount of time, wasn't it? It was only, what, four or five years, maybe six years, something like that? Yeah, no, not, about five years, I think, just five almost. Years. And I, what I'm amazed at to this day, I'm amazed how many songs we recorded in such a short space of time and how many places we went to. I mean, we went everywhere, I mean, around the world. Um, uh, and we were touring Europe all the time. 
um, we couldn't believe to what country. So, I mean, I got to the end, I didn't care where I was going. I didn't even know where I was going. I said, where are we? He said, Helsinki, you know, great, <laughs> lovely. <laughs> Made some great friends. We toured Germany. I couldn't believe it. The first time we went abroad, uh, we, we got the ferry because we had to take our van on it because it had all the equipment in it. And, uh, um, and we played in, in, uh, in France in a place called Lille. And I thought, oh, great. So playing in there. And I went to the loo in there. And there's, in those days, I didn't realise it. I said, there's women in the loo as well. This is a shared loo, you see. Couldn't believe it. So that was that. And then I thought by the time, when I walked down the gangplank to get off the, off the boat, I thought, strange things are going to happen. I'm going to be in another country. And I'm going to hear a fanfare and all kinds of stuff. And so <laughs> that was it. I was in another country. <laughs> It, it's incredible when you talk about the songs and everything that you guys came up with. I mean, you had oh, yeah. a, a number one album that's still regarded as an absolute masterpiece. You had a number one single, five other top ten hits, as well as various other charting hits as well. It was yeah. just the perfect mix of the four of you at that time. It just worked, didn't it? Oh yeah, it was, it was great. I mean, then we played Germany, and I thought we were gonna they're gonna hate us. All these kids were the same age as us. Met the same. They looked like us because we'd seen us on TV, and, and they were kind of mods and stuff. So we, we thought, oh, that's that's handy, you know. So, and I thought, well, we won the war, so they're not gonna like us. So, and they were fantastic kids, Germany. We got lots of great German friends, and it couldn't couldn't have been better. So we ended up touring Germany quite a lot. You know, had lots of it. So. Perfect. Um, more than just a, a musical group, though, you were more cultural icons as well, weren't you? At the forefront of what you spoke about, the mod revolution, the, the kind of the forefront of fashion and, and everything changing like that. Well, we were mods without knowing we were mods because, we, I mean, we just, we were, uh, I'll tell you what happened to me when I, when I, we all grew up in black and white. I mean, I remember as a kid in, in the east end of London, like in Stepney, and foggy old London town. I mean, you couldn't see a hand in front of your face. I mean, it was terrible. And not only that, growing up after the war, I still remember rationing mm -hmm. as a little kid growing up. And uh, everyone wore black and white. So it's like growing up in black and white. So it's either grey or black or, or white, sort of shirts and that sort of thing. Everyone was kind of, it's almost like a, 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 an unreal place, you know, and there was no colour in it whatsoever. And one day I found myself walking in all, all great east, and I saw this shop. Funny enough, it's the shop where Ronnie and Reggie Cray used to buy their buy their stuff, uh, clothes shop. And uh, I saw this bright red jumper. It's a bit, it reminds me of the Sylvan B, uh, Sylvan Spielberg film when it's in black and white in the war bit and there's a little girl walking in red and everyone else is in black and white. Exactly what happened to me. I saw this red caravel jumper. I went in and I just thought, I've got to have it. So I had to save up, it was about 30, 30 bob in those days. So, and I didn't have 30 bob, so I had to, had to, had to work hard cleaning cars and stuff, so I went. So I got a minute, I managed to go and buy this jumper and I put it on and that was it. So that, and I, I got some white Levi's, put them on, and that was basically. I didn't realise I was mate. I was that was a mod uniform, basically. First Caravelle, there you go. Fantastic. So, yeah, fashion, fashion became a part of us. We found ourselves before we had any money, just going to, in van, sort of finding things like that, you know, fairly cheap and whatever, and just dressing up and you know things and stuff, um, and making it up as we went along. So we didn't realise we were creating a, a fashion at the same time as creating another style of music. So it was, everything was a learning curve. We, know, we didn't know what we were doing from one day to the next, but it felt right. And that's kind of what helped as well in a way, wasn't it? It's almost like the band had um, incredible freedom and, and joy. And when I look oh, back yeah. at some of the videos now, you can see all, you're all smiling. You're always smiling in all your videos. It's fantastic. Well, we're all piss takers. We all put the piss out of each other and we just, we just love being with each other. We always, it's like a band of brothers. So it really hurt when we, when Steve Merritt left, it was it really, it's like one of your brothers has left, left home and we're not going to talk to you again or died or so, you know, it's kind of that feeling, a lost feeling. We didn't know quite what to do, but yeah. And we had this great, when we played together, we had this 
wonderful uh, telepathic sort of view of music between us all. I mean, no one ever told me what to play. I didn't, and, and that went round. It just, it just happened. Just magic. Right. Just magic. Magic. Yeah. Yeah. So you spoke about Steve leaving there. I mean, that must have been difficult when you see the success that you had at the time and how old you guys were. I mean, what was your initial reactions to that? Did you plan on keeping the band going or was it, that's it, game over? Well, when, 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 when Steve left, we, we were kind of lost. So we found ourselves, you know, in limbo. So um, luckily enough, we were friends with the Stones at the time. And uh, the Stones said, look, we've got our warehouse in Bermondsey, which is right in the East End where we are. And he said, well, what, we've got a soundproof room down there. We keep all our equipment. Why don't you go have a play down there? Get, you know, just have a, something to play so you, get, so you get to know which direction you're going in. So, so we did. And that's what we did every, every week for a couple of weeks or a few weeks until Ronnie Lane, one week, he, one week he, a day, brought down his, his new neighbour who just moved in next door. And that was Ronnie Wood. <laughs> So Ronnie was learning how, uh, or converting from bass because he was in the birds at the time. At that time, no, he was playing bass with the Jeff Beck band. And he was on a wage of 60 quid at that time. And uh, so um, so he, he, was, he came down, he, was, he played, a, I think he had a Fender. And he's learning how to, how to play or convert from bass to, to, to the Fender. So we, we just spent a lot of ages jamming. And then, and that, couple of weeks went by and then Ronnie brought down his best mate which was Rod Stewart and it, Rod, Rod just sat on the amps watching us play and then every every now and again we just we'd go up the Bermondsey Arms which is a pub up the road so we'd play for about an hour and then we'd go up the pub and this, this went on for a couple of weeks and then one day I said well we've got to get serious we've got, got to get got, got attack focus see what we're going to do so Ronnie Lane sang, and Ronnie's voice is always a great voice, his lovely voice, pure, pure value to his voice. And um, so that was great. I thought, okay, but still, still missing that missing ele element as far as I was concerned. And then Max started to sing, I went, yeah, okay. <laughs> and then, then Ronnie started to sing, and I went, mm, uh, Ronnie, Ronnie Wood, that is. Yep. And I went, yeah, great, okay. Still, I'm looking for around the room, and I keep seeing Rod sitting on the. I know Rob is a great singer. So the next time we went up the pub, I was I, I did a kind of Adam Faith on him. I put his arm around. I said, "Don't see, don't see a drink around the other bar." I mean, and it went, "Oh, okay." So we went around the other bar. I said, uh, "I said, can I have a quick word?" You know, so he said, "Yeah, what's up?" I said, "Do you feel? Do you think? Do you want? Do you think you? Do you want to join the band?" And he went. Oh great! Do you think everyone would let me? I went, yeah, of course they would. And luckily that evening, uh, Alvin Lee was having a, a little get together. I think it might have been his birthday, so uh, in a little muse place in the in the in the West End. So we're in there having a few spliffs and a whatever beer, and everyone's sort of chatting away. And I I said to the rest of the band. Uh, can I have a private word? So we went upstairs and I, uh, me, the two Ronnies and Mac. And uh, I said, well, I've asked Rod to join the van. Oh, we don't want another prima donna. We don't want anyone all walking out. I said, oh God, this went on for ages. I said, well, you know, I just stuck to my guns and I won. Good. So Ronnie Wood was in a de delicate position because it was his best mate. So, and and we didn't want anyone walking out on us. So I was I was feeling for that particular phrase. I mean, I, I knew exactly what the other guys meant, but knowing Rod, we got to know Rod. Rod was like one of the lads, one of the mates, you know, mm -hmm. it still is. So that's how we got together. That's how the faces started. Brilliant. Now, um, in terms of the, the band name then, um, I saw a story you told once about the record company that we're going to, sign you as the small faces still and you guys were saying no 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 not at all because we are a new entity a new group what happened in, in that situation there to become the faces rather than carrying on as the small faces well what, what happened was we said no no what, what happened was we ended up getting a record contract cut a long story short right uh with Warner Brothers and on the top of the on the top of the contract it said it said band name small faces so I said hang on we're 
We're not. The Small Faces is a completely different band, completely different to the Small Faces. So we're going to have a completely different name. And they said, well, if you don't sign us to Small Faces, you can't have all this money. <laughs> so I looked at you. Know, <laughs> okay, so I said, I said, I'll tell you what, the first album, we'll, we'll, we'll call it, we all agreed that we'll call it the Small Faces. Right? Um, and I said, but thereafter, thereafter we're known as the faces we all agreed that and that's how we go i said there's nothing small about us in other words uh rod was taller than us and so was ronnie wood there you go so i said if the three of us stood on each other's shoulders we'd be all right no problem <laughs> you just about um, so, right and so that's how the faces came it, it was ended, it couldn't have been better because that's it's ended up being a great name for the band you know and it also has a, has a history legacy to it as well, which is nice. Absolutely. So really, so whether Rod likes it or not, or, Rod, or Ronnie likes it or not, Ronnie would, um, which they do. I mean, um, they were met briefly members of the Small Faces. <laughs> <laughs> Always linked. Now, when it came to the, the, the faces, now it's no surprise given the, the members in the band, but it was just one huge party, wasn't it? Oh, it was great. I mean, because, I mean, we all liked to drink together. I mean, we did, we did, we did, we did like a drink. And uh, so we're always up at the pub, but we always, we were, I don't know how, I mean, I never, in the, in the small faces, I never used to drink a lot. I mean, I, I used to uh, have a, a, a lager now and again or whatever. But when I joined the faces, my whole drinking habits changed. I was, I was a boozer. And everyone else said, thanks, Rod. Thanks, Ronnie. You know, so we all got in there drinking together. Um, so, so it's like, it was, Better than being in a band. It's just the great thing about the being in a band. It's a great bunch of mates playing music together and drinking together. So that's how the band started, and that's how we were playing so laid back because we were drunk half the time. And so when we ended up doing gigs, it was like a party. So and it's like the audience so it might as well have been on stage, and we might as well have been in the audience. It was kind of that that, that feeling of yeah, let's have a great time together. So that's that's the best thing about the faces brilliant and um, just uh as an aside now i saw you mentioned once that you felt the band could have been better if perhaps there wouldn't have been so much partying if you'd maybe been a little bit more sober now it sounds mad given the experience and the lifestyle and the records you made and and everything else but is that something that you you've regretted since or at the time or anything like that that you didn't take it a little bit more seriously uh I don't. I think we were too drunk to. to like, we always wanted it. When we, let's put it this way: when we were sober, we were really good. <laughs> but then again, you know, I don't think we were getting it because that's part of the small faces. Uh, sorry, the faces makeup. And because I, I mean, we were good at certain. I mean, we, 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 I mean, we, most of the time we were good, you know. And then one, you know, the old, old gig we would get all smashed. So I don't. I, I don't know, that's how our reputation went around. But most of the time, we're okay. Perfect. And just a quick um, one I saw you, you mentioned as well um, about a story. Somebody asked you if there's anybody you would like to have met. And you said it, it would have been Elvis. And you had the chance to meet Elvis once, didn't you, in Vegas? But, but you never did. Yeah. Well, we were playing at a, a stadium in Vegas. And we, had, we were staying in LA. So we had two Learjets. Uh, so uh, to get us all in, because that's how I would get up there and back again. And so uh, when we, we landed, we did the gig, and then we were in, invited to go and see Elvis Presley play. Um, uh, Rod and I wanted to get back, so we, we said, no, we can see Elvis any time. So I think, so the rest of the band went to see Elvis, and then he ended up in bloody hospital, so we never got a chance to see The rest of the band went to see Elvis, loved it, and, and met Elvis, and God knows what we do. Me and Rod just legged it back to LA. <laughs> How times can change. Um, I'm going to skip forward a little bit now because we could, I could speak to you for hours and hours and hours, obviously, about your, your life and times. But we'll skip forward a little bit to, to Keith Moon now. Um, rock Keith, royalty. Right, good friend Keith. Yes, yeah, your, your good friend Keith, the extravagant showman. But like you said, he is a, a true friend of yours, wasn't he? Oh, he's a great friend of mine. Because the Small Faces and the Who toured all over Europe together, all over England together. We and Australia and New Zealand together. Spent a lot of time together. Uh, and practical jokes on each other all the time. Uh, great mate. And it's it's kind of 
very, very sad in a way that you spent the night before he passed away with him as well, didn't you? Well, I was forming another band with Glenn Johns, our record producer. We were, Ian and I were putting a band together, which is like half American, half English, kind of, kind of English Ingles sort of kind of type of feel, you know. Um, it's, oh, it's great. We had a record deal. We were just about to sign it for a million and a half dollars, which was a great lot of money in those days. And uh, so I was really excited about it. And uh, I'd just, just flown back from America to having, having met one of the band, the American, one of the band, one of the American guys, and found myself off a plane uh, into a, a premiere. Like, uh, Paul McCartney was having a, the premiere of the, his Buddy Holly film that he, he, he produced. And he was, I found myself in this, in, uh, instead of going to the premiere first, he yeah, had a party first. The after party first. So we're around the corner from the cinema in a, I think it was called Peppermint Park, I think the the place they had the, the party in. And I was on on a table with um me, Keith, um Paul and Linda McCartney, Paul's brother from the scaffold, and David Frost, who wasn't a sir then, um sitting around having a chat. And and David and Cenk, you know, and uh, I, so I, I said to uh, uh, Keith, said, well, what are you up to? I said, well, I just got stepped, stepped off a plane. I'm really tired. I said, I told him about the band. He said, oh, great, good. I said, what about you? He said, I said, you look, you're looking well. He said, yeah, no, he said, I'm off the booze. He said, I'm taking these pills that keep me off the booze. He said, if, uh, if, I, if I have a drink, they have a violent reaction on me. I get really sick and horrible. So he said, I, you know, so I don't touch a drink. I've been like that. I said, oh, great, keep it up. And that was that. So then we went around the corner, walked around the corner on mass to, to the Odeon in the uh, Leicester Square, watched the film. After the film had finished, I said goodbye to everyone, Keith um, and Pete and well, Roger and all that, everyone. And uh, left, went to bed, woke up the next day, rubbed my eyes turn the TV on, and the news was on straight away. And it said, uh, rock star Keith Moon has been found dead in his room uh, of a drug overdose. I went, no, what has he done now? What practical joke is he playing now? It can't be true, I've just been with him. And it turns out it was true. But it was an accidental. It's only when I joined him I found out what happened. What had happened is after that premiere, he'd, he'd gone home, because it's about, uh, I think it was about one one thirty in the morning. Uh, went took his normal pill that he would take, went to bed, and then woke up a couple of hours later, and thought it was morning. Um, made some breakfast, took this pill, his morning pill, and if you take those pills too close together, it slows your heart down. And that's how it happened. So it's an accidental overdose. So there you go. So according to the press, it's a drug overdose. Yeah, I like to spin things. Very that. sad, very, very sad, very sad. I mean, I, I would have given anything not to be in the, you know, I'd rather much rather him be there. As I've always said all the way through my whole career with the Who, you know, my time with the Who, uh, and then once again, a bunch of mates all the time because we toured a lot together. Um, so I've, I've always said there's only one drummer for the Who, and that's Keith Moon. And there always will be one. The only drummer for the Who is Keith Moon, even though I, I was kind of filling in for a bit, you know, to a I suppose, till, the, till they found someone appropriate. Luckily enough, they found Zach, and I, and I got Keith's drum kit, to, and I took it over to to, Keith, to, to to Zach when he was a kid, you know, mm -hmm. set him up in the front room as a surprise. And I said, there you go, you don't need all them drums, just play a little, sp you know, but anyway. So I, I showed um, uh, Zach how to play a little bit. Uh, hopefully I, I did him a favor. There you go. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Now, in terms of joining the Who, then that must. How did you feel at the time? Because obviously Keith Moon's a huge figure. He's he's massively well liked and respected by everybody as well. Um, you spoke there. You were already forming a different group, and there was a lot of money involved with that as well. So when Pete came to you and said, "Join the band," what was going through your head? Uh, well, I got a call from Bill Kirby, the Who's manager, uh, and he said, "He said, oh, Kenny, he said, I'll oh, come straight to the point." The, the Who have had a meeting, the band have had a meeting, and they want you to join the band and they're not considering anyone else. 
And I said, well, it's very, it's very flattering. Thank you very much. But I said, unfortunately, I can't. And he went, I could, I could hear his chin drop a little bit. I thought, oh, big silence. Huh? He said, what do you mean? I said, well, I said, well, I'm already, I've already formed a band with Glenn Johns. I told him all about the band I was doing. I said, well, I said, look, Pete's coming into the office a bit later. He said, why don't you come in and have a, ch a chat with him? I said, I was happy to see Pete. So, and that was only in Wardour Street, and I was living around the corner. So uh, I said, okay. So I met up with Pete a bit later. And we sat there for two hours talking uh, about the old, the, not the old days, the days that just literally we'd just gone by about the times that we had good times of touring and God knows what, laughing and joking and God knows what. And then Peter suddenly went, you've got to join the band. You're a mod, you're one of us. You're... <laughs> and so I kind of, I thought, then I kept saying to myself, you know what, I, I've got to do this. I, I, I know my brother and I don't want to let my, my new band down because we've got to come a long way. Um, and uh, so I said, look, let me go back and I'll, I'll have a word with my, new band and because luckily we were going to rehearse the next day so they're all in town so uh, so I said I said to them look I, I've, I've, had, I've had a meet with the Who I've had a call and uh, had a chat and I said well, they want me to join the band and they said Kenny you've got to and they were so gracious about it I said oh thanks I said okay as long as I've got your seal of approval it's fine and that's how I did it that's how I ended up in who, and I, but I said it, you know, I said there's no way uh, that I was going to copy Keith Moon, and no way I could be like Keith Moon. I, I'm a completely different drummer. Uh, I, I like the way Keith plays and all that. I like certain stuff he plays. I said so. I'm gonna, I can do certain things that because I like them. I like the way he plays them, so I'll do some of that. So, but in the in the main, I'm a straighter drummer. And I said we know that. And, they, and Pete said, look, in many ways, he said. You know, we, we have now a complete chance of doing something, you know, something completely different. So I went, okay, great. So that was one of the reasons I sort of went, yeah, to it as well, because, you know, I, we had a chance to do something completely different. But guess what? We never, <laughs> we never did anything completely different. <laughs> we did everything completely the same. That's so, true, you know, we made, some, we made a couple of albums, which were, were, were good. I was uh, going to say, yeah, you said you, you were a fill-in drummer and that's the way you saw yourself, but you, you were part of, of the group when they made two incredible albums and, and Live yeah. Aid as well. Oh, yeah, we did. Yeah, we did all that. But I mean, we, did, we did so many tours of America as well in such a short space of time. I mean, when I joined the band, I, I was back and forth to America. Uh, I think I was, I was about, must have been about 30 times on Concord coming back. Was, that was just that, without playing, you know, promoting the kids all right and Quadrophenia. You know, so it's kind of weird. So I played on a bit of both of those as well. So. <laughs> and what do you remember about um, the whole Live Aid experience then? Oh, Live Aid was, uh, well, we had Bob Geldof came around and uh, said, uh, we ended up in a wine bar. I said, look, I want the band to join uh, to do Live Aid, told us all about it. So yeah, we said, okay, yeah, we'll do it. So we did it. Um, and we ended up doing that. And what do you remember about the day? I mean, obviously there was so many superstars. Oh, the day was around. day was quite quite an in, incredible day. I mean, because it was uh, it, it, we'd all done Wembley Stadium before, so but we didn't. Re I mean, then the pennies started to drop. You're, you're playing in front of three billion people, so well, I can't remember the figure now. Um, so you kind of go, oh, sh you had to forget that you were playing in front of that many people. You played to the audience there. And you you only got like twenty minutes to play or so, or yep. half an hour to play, because there's so many bands that we get on it. So we had these on the, there was traffic lights actually on the stage facing the band, and it went sort of like, sort of same as traffic lights, you know, the 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 stop. <laughs> when it went red, we had to stop. <laughs> Otherwise, they pulled apart. And what was the atmosphere like behind behind the scenes then, off stage? What was it like? Because obviously everyone's milling around. I mean, how did that feel? Oh, it was great backstage. It was uh, a nice, nice uh, feeling of camaraderie, camaraderie, and we were all doing something together collectively as a music uh, uh, bunch, of, like a giant. All the bands came together and doing something really worthwhile. So it felt good, and also uh, the, the hard rock setup backstage as well and um, so all that was going on and all that. 
I didn't spend the, the, day, the day there though. Well, I did. I just learned to fly helicopters. So I was, uh, I'd been flying for a while, about a year or so. So I, I was living in the country as well, uh, just outside Dorking. And so I had the helicopter in the garden and I flew to Battersea and met the, um, and landed there. And then I got into uh, Live Aid, they had two, two bigger helicopters, taking ferry and people back to the stadium back again. And I ended up uh, uh, getting in one of those and one of the guys, the pilot said to me, I said, oh, I see you landed, so you can fly a helicopter. He said, do you want to co-pilot fly this one with me up, up to the stadium? So I said, yeah, great. And in those days, you, if you weren't co-pilot, you could write it in your log, so it was great. So I, although I wasn't, I wasn't converted, I didn't convert to that, but I mean, I was, you know, to, in order to fly that in the, in the right-hand seat, in, in the captain's seat, you'd have to, you'd have to convert to it. But, so I, but you can as a co-pilot, and you can put it in your log. Brilliant. And I'm not doing that. And that, because we had to be there at sort of, I know for the hour, like nine o'clock in the morning, or sort of 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, and so I didn't want to spend the rest of the day there, so I went back in, we landed back in, did it in reverse, went back to Battersea Airport. I got in the heli my helicopter, flew it back to where I live, and then watched it on TV. <laughs> Fantastic. And then I thought, and that was, and then, then about an hour before we went on, I did, I did exactly the same again. Um, I took a pilot with me to, who flew my helicopter, helicopter back, because so I knew that once I, once I was there, I'm staying there, and I'm going to have a drink afterwards. So, so that's so it was a very memorable day for me to do that. If you get my book, it goes into more detail. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, just skipping on a, a little bit again, uh, we spoke about you working with some incredible musicians and, and singers as well, Steve Marriott, Rod Stewart, Roger Daltrey, and you also worked with Paul Rogers as well, didn't you, of Free and Bad Company? Oh, Paul and, and I had a band together, yeah. We had a band together called The Law. We two of us formed it together. And how did that happen and then? I was, I was just, uh, well, what we'd done, we, we'd, uh, we'd done the Arms Tour. We'd played the Arms Tour, me, Eric Clapton, and... Uh, Jimmy Page, uh, Jeff Beck, and you name it, it was, uh, everyone was in it, you know, Bill Wyman on bass, and uh, yeah, uh, lots of, lots of oh, incredible, Chris Staten on keyboards, and you name it. Um, uh, I could go on forever, I just don't remember, Charlie Watts was on it as well, so Ray Cooper, um, it goes on and on. Um, and we got to know each other on that tour of America, raising his funds for Ronnie Lane. Um, and then I, w I, went, I met him in a club in London by chance, Paul. Mm -hmm. And as, as I walked in, he went, just the man I want to see. So we had to sit there and have a drink. He said, should we get together and have a place? And I just want to get a new band together. I said, okay, great. So um, the two of us decided to form The Law together. So we wrote this song called, I came up with the name of The Law. Mm -hmm. And we wrote this song called uh, Laying Down The Law. And that was it. And we made a great album. In fact, we made two great albums. One, the, the first album we presented to to Atlantic Records, they 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 they, they liked it, and they, they said, "No, it sounds like something you've done 15 years ago." I said, "That's exactly what we want to sound like, you know." So we, you've got to be a little bit more contemporary. So we went out with Chris Kimsey and, and recorded another album, uh, but we still like the first one. <laughs> so we should really release the first one now. Because yeah. it's so good. Um, anyway, so that's how that came. But I was very proud that we, we, we were together. We made a couple of great videos and stuff. and yeah. did a couple of great gigs and stuff. And it was, it was great. It was over before you knew it. You know? It was great. Fantastic. And then again, just skipping forward slightly more. Um, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. That's a huge accolade to have as a, as a musician, as a songwriter, as a singer, as, a, as anyone associated with a band. Now, it was 2012, wasn't it, that the small faces and yes. the faces were inducted together and you were there to... Twice to, in one go, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Do it all I as know, a job lot. Yeah. <laughs> um, so how did, how did you feel about that then, getting inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Well, I felt incredibly proud. I mean, uh, uh, Steve Barrett wasn't there to receive his... Well, because he was no longer with us, and there's no Rolly Lane. So um, we took um, Molly Marriott over with us, uh, Steve's daughter, and she she got up and received Steve's, and Ronnie Wood received 
uh, on behalf of Ronnie Lane, his his award, and we all gave a little speech and whatever, and it felt it felt amazing. It felt really, I felt special. I felt everything we've done has been recognised. We've been recognised. Our music's been recognised, and it was nice to be have that accolade, you know. So uh, and that was it, be part of it. So I was up there with all the greats, you know. So I'm really proud of it. Over there, it's a massive thing. You know? It's like being knighted over there, like you're a sir. Perfect. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you, Kenny. It really has been. I could sit here talking to you all day long as well, and I really do appreciate the time you've, you've taken out. It's a pleasure, real me. pleasure. You take care and don't catch anything that's horrible. <laughs>